Well, good morning, church. It is good to be with you. Whether you're here in the sanctuary, whether you're joining us from the comfort and safety of your own home via our live stream or listening on the radio at KTCU, uh, it is good for us to be together, and we give thanks for the technology that allows us to do that. We are this Sunday, as we are every Sunday, one church in many locations, and so it's good for us to be together in this way. We are in the midst of a series that we're calling Follow Me, and in this series, we're looking at how do we close the gap between the Christians that we are and the Christians that we want to be. How do we grow in our walk with God? We're looking at five different disciplines, what, what we have identified as essential practices that when practiced in Jesus' life and in the lives of Christians over the last 20 years. 2,000 years, uh, have transformed them and transformed the world around us. We started by talking about worship, the importance of gathering together with the community of faith each Sunday. Uh, Shannon talked about prayer in week two and challenged us, challenged us to pray five times every day, to say the, the Lord's Prayer three times, and then to say at least two other prayers in the, in the morning or in the evening, to be able to say, even if all we can muster in that moment is thank you, and that is enough. Last week, we talked about study. We talked about the importance of growing deeper in our faith and how that we go about doing that. Today, we're going to look at the fourth essential practice of the Christian life, and that is the discipline of serving God. Because over and over again in the scriptures, over a thousand times, we see the word serve or service or serving. It's a thread that runs throughout all of scripture that talks about the importance of our relationship with God. For instance, Joshua 22, verse 5, Joshua gathered together the children of Israel and reminds them of what they are to be about. Listen to this word. Love the Lord your God. We see that notion of worship there, don't we? Walk in all of his ways. We talk about what it means to follow God, to walk with God. Love the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. The second text that I want us to think about and look at this morning is from the letter to the church in Ephesus. As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we call it the letter to the church in Ephesus, but it probably wasn't a letter. It was more likely a sermon. And it wasn't just to the church in Ephesus, but scholars now believe that it was directed towards a number of churches in the area. And so in that way, it's also directed to us. And so I invite you to listen to this word now from Ephesians chapter 2. Today's reading is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Here begins the reading. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Here ends the reading. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> so I want to start this morning with a question. Relatively simple question, how many opportunities do you have, either have had already this morning or will have later this afternoon, how many opportunities will you have to serve God today? Five? Fifty? Five hundred? How many opportunities will you have to serve God? And what does it mean for us to serve God? That's what I want us to consider today. Ultimately, that, that God's primary mode of working in this world is through people. That God's primary mode of working in this world is through people, ordinary people, people like you, people like me. That is how God works in this world. If we look at the beginning of Scripture in the sixth chapter of Genesis, we see the story there of Noah's Ark 
And what we see, how that story begins, is that God looks down upon humanity and saw all of the evil, the violence that were being brought against human beings, what we were doing to one another. And it says that God regretted making human beings on earth. God regretted making human beings. And then it goes on to say, and God's heart was broken. That verse has always moved me. The injustice, the evil that exists in this world leaves God heartbroken. And so I want us to consider this morning, what are some of those things today that break the heart of God? I have to think that, that God down, looks down upon the injustices, upon the poverty, the racism, the injustice, the hate, the violence, all of that, that God looks and God's heart is broken. Back in the 1970s, there was a missionary by the name of Bob Pierce who famously prayed this prayer every day, let my heart be broken by the things that break your heart, O oh God. When I think of this, I think of the prophet Isaiah who was taken up to the throne room where he was given this vision where uh, Isaiah sees God and, and God says, who will go forth from me? Whom shall I send? And Isaiah simply responds, here I am, Lord. Send me. Here I am, Lord. Send me. I would argue that that, perhaps more than anything else, is meant to inform how we are to live our lives as people of faith. That, more than anything else, is meant to inform how we live our lives. As, as people of faith, we are to pay attention to what is going on in the world around us, to listen for God's prompting, to open ourselves, to respond to that call, here I am, Lord, send me. I see the things that break your heart, my heart is broken as well, send me. It was that same orientation, this willingness to serve in the story of Mary. You remember the story? Mary was 14, 15 years old at the tops. And this angel, Gabriel, appears to her and says, I have good news. You're with child, and that child is no ordinary individual. That is the Messiah. Now, if you're 14, 15 years old, if you're an unwed young woman, that would be anything but good news. Keep in mind that being pregnant outside of wedlock at that time was a crime punishable by death. And so there was a thousand reasons that she might have said no. In fact, there was probably a thousand reasons why she should have said no. But yet without hesitation, she doesn't argue. She simply opens herself up and says, here I am, a servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. In some ways, in a very real sense, you could say, all of history hinged in that moment on that response. Think of how the world would have been different if Mary said, no, nah, I'm good, thanks. But yet she says, here I am, a servant of the Lord. Let it be with me. What would happen to us, I wonder? What would happen to us if that became our prayer every day? That if we began each day with a simple prayer, here I am, Lord, do with me whatever you want. How might our world be different? How might our church be different? Shannon Moore, one of our associate ministers, uh, preached a sermon a couple of weeks ago, which, as I reminded you a moment ago, he invited us to pray five times every day, to simply pause for just a moment. What if, what if that first prayer every morning was simply that? Here I am, Lord. Use me. I'm a servant of you. Fill me. Send me. Use me to do your work in this world. How might our church be different? Keep in mind that we have about 3,000 members in University Christian Church. 3,000 active people. Can you imagine how the world, how the city of Fort Worth, how our church would be different if all 3,000 of us started each day with that prayer? Here we are, God. 
your church at work in the world, help us. Send us. Use us. How might Fort Worth be different? How might we be different? As I said, it's important for us to remember that God's primary way of working in the world is through humans, not necessarily through miracles, although I do believe that miracles exist. I've been in ministry for 30 years, and I have seen things happen in people's lives that can be described in no other way. But yet, I believe with all that I am that that is not God's normal way of working. Think about it. If it was, we wouldn't need hospitals. We wouldn't need medicine. We wouldn't need seat belts. We wouldn't need life insurance. If something were to happen, we'd just simply pray, know that God would take care of it in that moment. But that is not how God works in this world. God's primary way of working in the world is through people, through people like you and me. We become instruments. We become co-operators with God working in the world. God sends us. God uses us. We become tools for God's ministering in this world. You could even say that in many ways that's why we were made. That is the very purpose of our being. You heard the text. Paul tells the church in Ephesus that you were made for this. Did you hear? Did you hear for what we have been made created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. To be our way of life. Paul is not saying that it is through those good works that we are saved. No, at the beginning of the passage, he talks about how we are not saved by works, but we are saved by grace. And so our good works, our serving in this world, is to be the response to that grace. To look at the unmerited grace and love of God, which none of us deserve, but all of us receive, and in the response to that incredible gift, we have no other option, no other response than to serve God. That's why we were made. That's why God created us and gave us voices and hands and feet and hearts and minds. We are meant to do good for each other, to care for one another, to share love, and to just do justice, and to to practice kindness. That's why we were made. Now, interestingly enough, there there is something about doing good works purely for other people, not for anything that we might get in return, that actually blesses us and heals us, that when we turn outwardly, that we become healed inwardly. Study after study shows this, not necessarily why we do it, but just a side benefit. That when we care for others, when we serve each other, when we get out of our own selves, it lifts our spirits. The Mayo Clinic, a number of years ago, compiled a a ton of data from studies about the, the benefits of serving God by volunteering. And they found that volunteering reduced the risk of depression that those that served were more mentally and physically fit and had lower stress levels. There was another study published by Carnegie Mellon University that found that, that adults over 50 who volunteer regularly have lower blood pressure than those that did not. The scientific evidence is strong that serving others is good for our health. It impacts us physically, emotionally, and yes, spiritually. There was another group of sociologists that studied 2,000 people over a five-year period, and they looked at factors that led to happiness. And they looked at those that identified, self-identified themselves as very happy, and what they discovered is that those that are very happy serve on an average, volunteer an average of 5.8 hours per week. Albert Schweitzer, the great doctor and missionary and philosopher, the musician, once said, the only ones among you who will truly be happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. There are those great 
acts of service, those that dedicate their lives, that leave their former lives behind, that become missionaries or join the Peace Corps. They, they leave and sacrifice everything in order to change the world. But I would argue that most often the call to serve is lived out in many small ways on a daily basis. That sometimes it's as small as noticing someone who needs an encouraging word. Simply the kindness of a smile or a simply hello. Kevin Hines was determined a number of years ago to take his own life. He walked across the Golden Gate Bridge. And when he reached the middle, he decided in that moment to jump. Now, having grown up in the Bay Area, I can tell you that the number of people that survived that fall is very, 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 very small. But yet he did. And he will tell you to this day that the reason that he survived is so that he could tell his story. And the story that he tells is that as that day, as he was walking across the bridge, he decided he was still conflicted. This is not sure if this is, I'm not sure. And so he decided as he parked his car and started walking to the center of the bridge that if anyone, even one person smiles, notices, even says hello to me, I won't jump. But no one did. Only reinforcing the fact, his idea that no one cared about him. You see, his story reminds us that acts of service, that kindness, the way that we are meant to, to, to care for one another on a base, daily basis doesn't necessarily involve work that is difficult or complicated. Sometimes it's easy as, as paying attention to those people around you, simply making eye contact, offering a simple smile. Do you remember what, do you remember what Mother Teresa once said? There are no great things in this world anymore. Just small things done with great love. Here's what I believe, that what it takes more than anything else is simply a willingness to be interrupted. A willingness to be interrupted. I don't know about you, but I want more than anything else for my life to be about those acts of kindness, compassion, those acts of service. But the truth is, I'm busy. I got stuff to do. There are times when I can feel the weight of the world pressing down on me on those things that I have left to do but yet have left undone. Does anybody else ever feel that? Like you're burning the candle at both ends. How many of you feel like you would love to do more? You just don't have the time. Or if you run into someone uh, who needs something but you're so busy, you're so preoccupied that you don't even notice. You don't even notice you're not paying attention. Or if you do notice and you think, boy, that's something that that person needs. I wish that I had the time to give it to him. Do you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Jesus tells a story about this man who was beaten and robbed and he was left to die on the side of the road. And a couple of people come walking by and they notice him, but they just keep walking past do you remember who they were? They were deeply religious people. They were too busy to stop and help. And the one who did, the one who did, who was probably just as busy as the other two, but, but saw that man and knew in that moment that this matters more than any of the other busy things that I have planned to do with my day today. We've got to be willing to pay attention. We have to be willing to be interrupted. Monday night, one of our ministers, Jessica Vaquetta, got a phone call from one of our members of our congregation, Meg Pitts. Meg is a flight attendant for Southwest Airlines, and over the last several months, Southwest has been instrumental in making extra flights to fly refugees from Afghanistan from one place to another. She has been so moved by this, Meg has, that she started volunteering with refugee services. Meg called JV and said, 
there's this situation. We could use some help. There's a family of 11 that are arriving tomorrow. We, we thought we had a place for them to stay. It's hard to find an apartment that'll house 11 people. We thought we had one, but it fell through at the last minute. Is there anything that University Christian Church can do to help? JV, who I'm fairly certain had a busy week planned already, started making phone calls and sending texts. Volunteers started coming out of the woodworks, and pretty soon, pretty soon we welcomed this family into our church home. They arrived on Tuesday, and since then we have done such good work that they sent us another family yesterday, and so now we have 18 refugees living for a few days in our house. God's house. There have been people, this flood of volunteers who this week have interrupted their lives because they were willing, they were paying attention, they listened to that nudge, that call from God, and I would be willing to bet that every single one of them, every single one of them will tell you that they have been blessed this week. So here's what I want to say. You have to be paying attention. You have to be willing to be interrupted. And what you will find in those moments is some of the most meaningful moments of your entire life. When I look at the stories of Jesus and read what happened to him in his ministry, I'm willing to bet that some of the most significant moments of his life, of his ministry, happened in those moments when he was being interrupted. How would your life be different if you were more intentional in your pursuit of the practice of serving God by serving other people? How would your life be different if you began each day with a simple prayer? God, here I am. Use me. Send me. So here's the challenge. You knew there was going to be a challenge. This week, each day, I want to invite you, I want to challenge you to do five acts of kindness each day. They don't have to be big. It could be as simple as a smile and a compassionate word. But each of us were to do five each day. How would our community be different? How would we be different? if we simply woke up each morning and said, here I am, Lord. Send me. 